Do we believe that prayer makes a difference? What do y'all think? Do you believe that prayer makes a difference? Uh, when you pray, should you be specific? Now, amen, yeah. Uh, now, there's some, uh, you know, and I know I've done it myself. I pray for all the missionaries. And I go on, right? Now, that's kind of vague and out there, but at least there was something thrown towards those missionaries, right? But I believe if we really, if we really have this idea that prayer is powerful and prayer is important, we should be specific, right? We should be specific in how we're praying. Tonight, our focus is kind of be, going to be on the persecuted church. The persecuted church. And maybe you don't know what a persecuted church looks like. So we're going to watch a little video here. And I'm going to kind of give you an idea of what the persecuted church looks like. My name is Jeanette. I am a Christian and I love Jesus with all my heart. I love my children and I love the people of my country, the Central African Republic. There are both Christians and Muslims in my country and we lived as neighbors as I worked to reach them for Christ. But my hope for a peaceful life didn't last. Our village was ambushed by the Islamist attackers Guns started firing, and we started running as fast as we could into the bush. All the Christians in my village were killed or driven into hiding. I fled with my children. We didn't even have time to put on our shoes or clothes. Attacks like these have been targeting Christians in the Central African Republic for eight years and continue today. Churches and missionary stations that have been built over decades have been destroyed along with Christians' homes that have been burnt to the ground. In one area, the only structures that remained were the metal roofs of two churches. Thousands of Christians have spent years in makeshift temporary shelters far from their homes as the violence and instability continues. Delivering desperately needed help to displaced Christians often means overcoming impassable roads, using cargo planes, trucks, motorcycles, bicycles, and even canoes. With God's help, supplies are making it to Christians scattered throughout various camps. Today, Jeanette and more than 30,000 Christians in the Central African Republic have been driven from their homes, all because of their faithfulness in maintaining a witness for Christ in majority Muslim areas in the face of severe Islamist violence. These courageous believers, our Christian brothers and sisters in the Central African Republic, have shown God's love and forgiveness to their persecutors. They continue to faithfully follow the Lord and trust Him to meet their needs. Christ, our hope in life and death. You know, for the last little bit, we haven't been able to come to church. But it wasn't because there was somebody here to kill us, right? It wasn't because we had persecution coming down on us. It was because there was a, a, this disease and this issue that we've been dealing with for a long time, right? But what if we were in that condition? And I honestly, I could see us being in that condition here in a few years. <laughs> I really could. Each and every one of you, us having to go meet somewhere besides a building that's public, you know, to preach the name of Christ. I mean, right now we have a whole month where all they do is say, uh, celebrate sexual immorality, right? And, uh, and anybody who speaks against it is thrown off the side in the cancel culture, right? Shoved away. How long will it be before that shoving turns into persecution, right? Persecution. And just like the Central African Republic, where they, were, uh, they began uh, with Muslim neighbors, the Muslim neighbors turned on them, they got the power, and it caused all this disruption to take place. Persecution isn't an unfamiliar thing for the Christian. 
And we need to understand that because we've always lived in this kind of, well, I might go to church, I might have church, I might not, you know, whatever. You know, it doesn't really matter about if I witness to this person or not. You know, in this American lifestyle, we've got this lazy boy uh, church sometimes, right? Uh, the lazy boy church. Uh, but that's not what God has called every Christian to be, right? It's not what He's called us to be. Now, the church at Thessalonica, it was personally established by the P Apostle Paul. Anybody ever read uh, Thessalonians, 1st or 2nd Thessalonians before the Bible? Yeah? Uh, th that church was established by the Apostle Paul. And he did that on his second missionary journey. Unfortunately, though, when he established that church, it automatically became a persecuted church because the Jews in that area uh, did not like what Paul was preaching. And this second missionary journey happened around A.D. 50, and the writing of 1 Thessalonians was shortly after that had happened. And his letter in 2 Thessalonians was written during his uh, longer stay at Corinth, uh, probably less than a year later. What we know, though, uh, from Acts 17, 1 through 9, is that Paul's gospel preaching and teaching in the synagogues in Thessalonica resulted in the opposition and the creation of the church there. And uh, it led to the persecution of them by the local authorities. So we're going to look in a minute. We're going to pray specifically for the persecuted church, people in the persecuted church. That's what we're going to try to do. Uh, and we're going to look to 2 Thessalonians 3 to see how Paul chose to pray for those persecuted believers. But before we jump into that specific prayer, uh, we need to understand what persecution is. We kind of saw a little bit of that in the video, didn't we? And what was occurring there. Um, sometimes we think these general troubles in our fallen world are, a t are, are, are what persecution is, and that's not the case. The general troubles that we face, both believers and non-believers, uh, they lose their jobs, right? Some of y'all may have lost your job this past year, right? May have lost it, had to go look for another one. Uh, maybe you got a life-threatening illness during this time. You know, a lot of people did, didn't they? Some people made it and some people didn't. Um, also, there, I mean, there's lots of different things. But there's a difference in suffering for righteousness' sake. You know what I'm saying? There's a difference in suffering for righteousness' sake. And uh, it's a specific opposition that every biblical disciple goes through. No matter where they live, they will experience as a result of their bold and faithful witness. If you're not facing persecution today, it's because you don't have a bold witness. Somebody is going to persecute you in some way. Why? Because the devil has this world, and he doesn't like people telling the truth in this world, right? You're going to face some kind of persecution. Jesus himself even said, if the world hates you, it hated me first. Now, I kind of want us to just be able to distinguish between these two different types of suffering. Uh, Christian persecution, it kind of follows uh, this idea. It's kind of a pattern. First of all, you'll have somebody in the Christian faith, okay? And it results in the action of this bold and faithful witness of Christ, right? What I tell you, if you have a bold and faithful witness, you're going to face some type of of persecution. You're going to rub somebody the wrong way. Somebody's not going to like the message that you have. So you've got the Christian faith, but you have to add something to get persecution. Next, you have to add a persecutor. You have to add somebody, an individual, a group opposed to the witness of Christ and his message. They're opposed to it, right? So we've got a persecutor, but we don't have persecution until there is an attack. An attack. An attack, uh, the motive of it is an opposite opposition that intends to silence the witness. It could be physical. It could be uh, mental. They may attack you, uh, you know, uh, by, by trying to tear down your character. It, there's lots of different ways they would try to silence uh, that witness. And out of all three of those, it'll equal persecution. Turn your Bibles to Acts 17 tonight. It says here, Now when they had passed through Amphilus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Remember, this is where Paul begins this church in Thessalonica. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. 
opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed, praise God, and consorted with Paul and Silas. They got together with him. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. So lots of the Gentiles are coming in uh, who, have this, uh, who have been interested in God, but not so much the Jews. And of the chief women, not a few. So there's quite a few that came in. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. And that's the King James uh, words or some uh, rough guys, right? Some gangster-like guys. And gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not... And they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. That's the ruling government, right? Saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. So... What do we see here? We see persecution, right? Uh, what happened? The Christian faith. In verses 3 and 4, what do we see? He went into their synagogue. He took three days trying to explain out of the synagogue who Jesus Christ is. Who is Jesus Christ, church? He's the Savior of the world, isn't he? He's the one that saved my soul, the one that saved your soul, right? Jesus Christ. He saved them. And, and the idea here is, he was telling them about this, and that upset those Jews because they did not want, uh, uh, they did not like that idea of who Jesus was. You remember, Jesus is a very controversial figure. They had him crucified, didn't they? So, uh, so he's preaching the Christian faith. He's boldly witnessing. And then comes the persecutor. Who's the persecutor here? It's the Jews. The Jews who did not believe. We see that in verse 5, right? The Jews who did not believe, those leaders, come against the one who's having the Christian faith, but there's not persecution until an attack takes place. What happens first? Jealousy. They're jealous. People are listening to Paul instead of listening to us now. We're the religious people. We're the high and mighty ones. We're the ones who have all the uh, knowledge and authority about God. Why are they going down here and listening to this old crazy man Paul? Right? They didn't like that. So there's jealousy. And out of that jealousy, there's an uproar. They begin to attack this house. They make up lies about who Paul is. And there's even extortion taking place here, right? And all those things equaled out into persecution. Persecution. Now, now I want you to see how to pray for the persecuted. How to pray for somebody who's being persecuted. Uh, you may have to pray that for ourselves. We don't know. But here's how to pray. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now here he gives us our first point in verse 1. He says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Here's what we want to pray for. We want to pray that even though people are coming against us, that the word of the Lord will have a free course to go out, right? You know... We closed our doors for a time, didn't we? We had to close the doors, right? But we prayed, and the word of the Lord gave us a free course where we could still go out over the internet, didn't he? <laughs> the Lord gave us opportunity to reach others through that witness. We could have just sat down and not did anything, right? Oh my goodness, we just can't meet for three months. We'll just, but no, we found a way. That the word of the Lord would have free course. It may not be as free as it was before, but it's pretty free now. And I tell you what, it's gave me a taste to want to, to preach it more. You know what I'm saying? To preach it more. I missed this. I don't know about you, but I missed it. I missed seeing y'all halfway through the week. I missed uh, stirring up my battery halfway through the week, right? I missed that. You don't get that across the screen, but the word of the Lord still got out, didn't it? We still brought it on out, right? And that's what we were praying. And God allowed that to happen. Only God can allow that to happen. No matter who comes against you to, to close your doors. or and, and, and like I said, this wasn't persecution that closed our doors this time, okay? That wasn't what closed the doors. 
There, but there was a closing of that. But we pray that God would give us that free course. God is the one who allows how much can happen. We've got to have faith, don't we? We've got to have faith to go ahead and bring that word out, that bold witness, even if people are going to stand against it. Right? Right? Uh, so, verse 2 here. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Amen or oh me, right? Amen. All men do not have faith. All women do not have faith. All mankind. There's a lot of people out here who don't have faith. A lot of people are unreasonable. You can sit down with them and you can talk to, with them about the Word of God and they don't want to hear it, do they? I mean, it's like their heart is so hard that, they, that you can't get through to them. There's no way that you can get through right past that barrier. And you know, the scripture talks about a point in time when a man's heart gets so hard that God just leaves him there. He does. He just leaves him in that condition. And God, we, we should pray that God would deliver us from unreasonable and wicked people. We need to pray for that, right? We need to pray for the wicked people that they get saved. But when they get unreasonable, there ain't much you can do. There really isn't. So, it goes on to say here, Paul giving these, these different points at the end of his letter, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. God's going to keep us from evil. Even if we die, God's going to keep us from evil, ain't he? Right? We're going to continue on past this life regardless because we have life in this life, right? So he has given us that. He will establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence, he says, in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. He's asking them to continue this little church in the midst of this persecuted area, isn't he? And you know what? It is good not only to pray for somebody, but to come up beside them and tell them, Brother, I got confidence in you. I encourage you. Right? Right? Am I right? Yeah? Yeah. It's good to, to encourage one another. Scripture tells us to encourage one another, to lift one another up, to help one another, to look for the good in each other, and to encourage that. It's easy to find the bad, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? You imagine if those people over there in, um, in the Central African Republic some of those people went through hardship to come to church that Sunday, but some of the people didn't come, and those people looked down on them. Imagine that happening. Imagine that happening. The people who came looking down on those others and discouraging them instead of encouraging them, right? I imagine that a church going through persecution, there's a lot of good people in there for a church going through persecution, okay? There's a lot of good people. You ain't got time to bite and snap at one another when uh, the devil's after you, do you? Right? Right? It's loving one another. It's encouraging one another. And that's what he said. I know that you can get through this. I know God's with you. And then he finishes with this. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and in the patient waiting for Christ. Now listen here. God's coming back, isn't He? And the wicked... And the unreasonable men are going to be cast aside, aren't they? We know what happens at the end of the book, right? We know what's going to occur. So we should live victoriously knowing that, right? Even if you're shoved down, even if you're being persecuted, even if you're going through stress and trial and tribulation, we should live victoriously knowing that Christ is coming. The patient waiting. My father's coming home, right? My father's coming home. So, uh, you know, you might ought to get ready for that, right? I'm always amazed when I think about the Apostle Paul down there in that prison. And him and Silas are down in there and that guy's just beat the far out of them, right? They're bloody. They're spitting blood out their mouths. They may have lost a few teeth. Because that, that guard, he's beat uh, the life out of them. And they're down there, they're chained up. And it'd be real easy to sit down there and start whining and crying and giving up and saying, Oh me, you know, I, I followed this Christian life and it sure, it, look where it led me to. 
Here I am in this old dark, dangy prison, and that ain't the kind of prison that they put them in today now. This is a real prison where they put them in there, right? The smell of urine all around and feces all around them, right? We're talking about a nasty place tied down in there. And what do they start doing? They start singing and praising God down there in that cell, right? And their persecutors outside thinking, what is wrong with those nuts? Singing and praising God in the midst of all of that, right? Why would they do something like that? That's why. The patient waiting for Christ. And what did Christ do? He tore down the walls, didn't he? And they could have walked on out and that guy, he could have fell on his sword and died. You know why he would have fell on his sword? Because he knows that if his people come back and all the prisoners got away, he might as well be dead anyway. But then Paul and Silas look up and what did they say? Don't do that. Come to know my Jesus, right? Their enemy, the guy who knocked their teeth out, come to know my Jesus. If you ever have the uh, honor of being a persecuted Christian, be like that. Be like that. Be like that. Because that's who God has called us to be, right? That's who God has called us to be. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube. But I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.